Good morning. Good to see you here as we've asked in the presence of the living God on this day, the God who gives himself to us uh, in the word and in the sacraments. Please note by way of announcement, uh, by the way, congratulations, the uh, uh, social ministry team made the newspaper yesterday. It was a good article, good to see uh, for this ministry, uh, undies for everyone. Uh, please note that in the bulletin, by the way, and congratulate a social team uh, member when you see them. Please note all the other detailed announcements, small group ministries and uh, outreach ministry like the Food for Life uh, ministry. Please take note of that. And of course, uh, you may peruse all of the other detailed announcements this morning. Uh, don't do it during the sermon, however. That's just a special plea, you know. At this time, let's prepare our hearts for worship with the music of the prelude. Robin. During the time of confession, you're invited to stand or kneel as you are able. We prepare our hearts and minds for worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God of resurrection life, 
We come before you today as those who would die to sin and rise to newness of life. Raise from death the good that is in us and gift us with the good that is not in us. We have failed you. Give us the skill and the desire to bring healing into this world. Lord, make us channels of blessing for the impoverished and injured souls of this world. As the Apostle Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 5 and elsewhere in his writings, if in Adam and Eve all have died, so now in Jesus Christ all are made alive. Let us rejoice in the life-giving power of God's unconditional love. Our sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. Amen. We join in the hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Lord God, you call us to show mercy as our response to your mercy. Give us the power we need to live your grace. Through Jesus we pray in the Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture lessons of this day. This morning's reading is taken from Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 9 to 14. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors. When you obey the Lord your God, by observing commandments and decrees that are written in this book of law because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it so that we may hear it and observe it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. Thank you, Lord. The psalm for this day is from Psalm 25. You may speak the parts that are in bold print. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. Here ends the psalm for this day. Please stand for the reading of today's gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 10, selected verses. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, 
A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Love, love, love. Everybody likes love, right? Everybody. I've met very few people who would actually vote against love. If I took a poll, I'm sure that love would be considered not only the top religious value, but also the top human value. Love. Love wins. Love wins. That was even the title of a book by uh, an evangelical minister and writer uh, named Rob Bell, Love Wins. But that doesn't make things easy, does it? I mean, it was kind of easy for the Beatles to sing back in the 60s, all you need is love. And it's easy to say that religious faith boils down to love. It's easy to say that. And it's easy to say that the secret of all human life is love. And it's easy to say the words, God is love. But love is like any other word. Love is a loaded word, a powerful word, and it requires definition. If a word is to really mean something, then that word needs to be fleshed out. It needs to be lived in real life. You know, love, love meant something to me when I was 16 years old, when I had a crush on Jill or Wendy. And uh, actually, I had a crush on both of them at various times. And I'm not really sure they ever knew it, by the way. But love had a certain meaning for me then. And love had meaning when I discovered that I loved reading uh, biographies and good novels. And love had quite another meaning, though, uh, when tragedy struck and I lost my father suddenly. Love has a very specific meaning when I've held a dying loved one in my arms, and even when I have lost a dear pet, you know, the word love comes up often in that circumstance. Love is like any other important word. 
It begs for a definition. And it takes on different meanings depending upon the context. Words like love need to have sort of flesh and bones in real and lived experience. And love, like any other word, needs to be interpreted. Words need interpretation. Love needs interpretation. And the interpretation of words is critically important for all of life when you really think about it. All you need to do is look at the importance of words in a document like the United States Constitution. And when Supreme Court judges take the bench, they are interpreters of words. And whether you like their interpretations at a given moment in history or not, those are specialists in the art of interpreting words. And so we have today's reading from Luke chapter 10, where a specialist in interpretation approaches Jesus. And Luke calls him a lawyer, a lawyer. And that means for that time and place that he was an expert in the biblical law, especially the first five books of the Bible, known as the books of Moses, and also known as the Torah. He was an expert in those pages and with those words. Now Jesus has become at this point a rather famous teacher, healer, and prophet. And those with more professional religious training perhaps, they would want to test Jesus to get a feel for uh, the one they considered to be the new kid on the block. Apparently, Jesus didn't have formal training in the way that other experts in the law might have had. He had no Ivy League diploma. And maybe, maybe the lawyer is kind of like me when I want to test someone like T.D. Jakes or some other famous television preacher who's had different training. I relate to the urge to sort of test a preacher who's having great influence in the culture. And so this lawyer, this expert in the Bible, he wants to test Jesus. He wants to test the knowledge and the wisdom of this relatively new rabbi. And so he asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus does what rabbis do often. He answers a question with another question. Jesus asked him, What is written in the law, and how do you read? In other words, what does the Bible say, and how do you interpret? Now, in that time, some experts would have said, You must obey strictly all 613 of the commandments in the first five books of the Bible. All 613 commandments. Now those were the more rigid and conservative experts at that time and religious leaders. You must obey all 613 commandments to participate in the best life. That is the eternal quality of life. By the way, it's important to know that the word eternal or eternal life for the gospel writers, it's not just about life after death, right? It's not just harps and angels and such. Eternal life is also about the quality of life that we live here, now, Today, your best life now, I'm not a big fan of Joel Osteen, but I stole his title there for just a second. Your best life now. 
What must I do to inherit eternal life is the question. And Jesus asked, what does it say in the scripture and how do you read it? Well, the man answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. In other words, 613 commandments can be boiled down to love. Love, love, love. And even that summarization, that core element of the law that we know as the Ten Commandments, those boil down to love. All you need is love. Now, of course, that word needs to be interpreted, fleshed out. And Jesus perhaps pleases the lawyer on this day when he affirms the lawyer's answer. Jesus says, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. Case closed. The court can be out of session now, Mr. Lawyer. But not yet, not yet. Because this guy is a careful lawyer. He wants to save face, perhaps. He wants to keep the upper hand in the conversation. He wants to show his wisdom. And so he asks the further question, And who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? This person to whom I'm to show love. Who is the neighbor? You notice he doesn't ask who God is. He doesn't ask what love means. And I assume that he and Jesus share on those two accounts. I'm sure they share the concept of God. And I'm sure they share the idea of love being an action more than an emotion. But maybe this guy is looking for a loophole to avoid actually having to take action or to avoid being uncomfortable with this answer. You know, the famous comedian of days gone by, uh, W.C. Fields, he was a very non-religious guy and he was known to be very non-religious. And when he was on his deathbed, a friend caught W.C. Fields reading the Bible. And he was shocked, and he said to him, Fields, what are you doing now reading the Bible? And Fields answered. He looked up and he said, I'm looking for the loopholes. I'm looking for the loopholes. Well, this lawyer perhaps wants to test Jesus, of course, maybe wants to stump Jesus. And so the lawyer presses this very hard question. Maybe the lawyer feels some pressure, you know. He wants to avoid the implications of having given the right answer. That happens. You know, we say things like, Jesus is the answer. Or we say, Jesus is Lord. And we don't really consider sometimes the implications of those words. What does it mean for daily life that Jesus is Lord? It might mean many other things are not indeed Lord. So maybe this guy can find a loophole when he asks, And who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Sometimes it's good to have the correct answer. But we prefer those to be sort of on paper or in the classroom. We often don't want to really try living the answers. It's one thing to know the right answer. It's quite another thing to live the answer. And we like having answers. But practical considerations are another matter. 
You know, it's even true of actions, of rituals, of things like prayer and worship. A great theologian named Karl Barth, he once made this statement about prayer and about worship. He said, To clasp your hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. To clasp your hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. A simple action of clasping your hands in prayer or kneeling in prayer or lifting your hands in prayer can be an act of rebellion against the forces of this world. So just like knowing the right answer, proper and good worship has everyday practical implications. I think often about my experience of uh, learning how to drive a tractor-trailer in the tractor-trailer school. Um, Those of us who like taking quizzes, right, and memorizing things, uh, we love the classroom instruction. We had uh, probably seven or eight weeks of uh, classroom instruction. And we especially liked it when we got to watch an hour of videos, you know. That's, the, uh, that's often the teacher's way out to show a video. He disappeared when the videos came on, you know, I noticed that. But we liked the classroom instruction, but what, what became, made, made us kind of nervous, really, Uh, was when we were invited to go out into what they call the yard. And out in the yard, there were several acres of flat land where we had to get into the trucks and learn how to back them up. And that would have been okay, except um, the teachers, they were not highly skilled as people persons. Let's just say that. I think they came right from military boot camp to teach in that place. And uh, they had a tendency to lose their tempers uh, when you backed up in the wrong way. And by the way, backing those things up, is uh, that's a daunting task. And so many of us wanted to stay in the classroom, you know. It's a lot easier to stay in the classroom and, and do well on the quiz and everything. But to actually go out and do it, that's another matter. And you know, you don't, you don't study engineering in order to stay in the classroom. You go out and you do it. So, hey Jesus, we might say, we agree on God, we agree on love, but would you please continue the class session? Let's stay in the classroom for a minute. Show me on the blackboard who is my neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Define that for me. But Jesus wants us to get out of the study hall. He believes the whole point of knowing the rules is to actually play the game. So Jesus answers this question by telling a story that we now call the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. You know, we believe, teach, and confess in the Christian church that God took on flesh and blood in the person of Jesus. We call it the incarnation. It's at the center of our faith. God took on real human flesh in the person of Jesus. And in a similar way, love and the definition of love, as in love my neighbor, that takes on flesh in the story of a bruised and broken man who is helped and healed by an outcast. An outcast. We'll get to that in a moment. You know, truth makes no real difference until we see it become flesh and live among us. So there is this in the story, this wounded, half-dead man... By the way, in the Latin translation of this, uh, for those into Lutheran history, I don't assume anybody would know this particular thing. 
But the, uh, the word in Latin for half dead is the word seminex, seminex. And that was the name of a uh, rebellious little seminary in St. Louis back in the early 1970s. I'm sure it, was, it meant seminary in exile, but I'm sure that the word seminex in Latin did not escape uh, those who were on the faculty. And that's a whole other subject. But it is interesting that that is the word in Latin for this man who's lying there half dead. And two men come by in the story, a priest and a Levite. Two men come by who, well, they know the answers. You know, you have a priest who works in the temple. The Levite was one who would assist the priest in the temple. These are guys who should know the answer for sure. But they pass by. They see the fellow, but they pass by on the other side. Those who knew the truth of life avoided helping the wounded man. But then comes a man who could not possibly know the right answers. And that man is a Samaritan. A Samaritan. And as far as the Jewish people were concerned, a Samaritan was nothing more than a heretic. A heretic. Now a heretic is a person who believes the wrong things and worships in the wrong ways. A heretic has bad beliefs and poor behaviors, at least in the eyes of those calling him a heretic. And by the way, this all goes back into history. 700 years before this, things happened that uh, made the people of Judea absolutely hate the Samaritans. And so to the people of Jesus' place and time, and the people this lawyer served, the Samaritan was a surefire, died-in-the-wool heretic. And I think, I think that's why Jesus makes that guy a hero in the story. We could call the Samaritan the orthodox heretic. The orthodox heretic. Because for Jesus, true orthodoxy involves putting love, real love, ahead of law. In Jesus' vision, love can trump the law. Real truth is living a life of compassion for the other. And there's a deep, deep point to the story. The deep truth here is that we don't go out and find our neighbor. We don't find our neighbor. We don't locate somebody out there and say, hey, there's my neighbor over there. No, the point of this story is we become the neighbor. We become the neighbor. In one sense, we create our neighbor. We create the neighbor in the way that we act toward others. In other words, the neighbor begins with us. Neighborhood begins with us. The neighbor is found in our own attitudes and actions. That's why Jesus poses this final question to the lawyer. Jesus points to the, uh, the priest and the Levite and then the Samaritan, and he asks the question, which of these three proved to be neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Which of these three was a neighbor to him? You see, the real question is not, who is my neighbor? The real question is, how do I become a neighbor to the wounded, the wandering, and the lost? How do I become a neighbor? Jesus is saying what an old slogan uh, has said for years. I'm sure you've heard this. Do you want to see change? Do you want to see change? Then be the change you want to see. Be the change you want to see. 
You see, you can't control how other people behave. You can't control what happens in life, but you can control your response to those people and to those things. Don't worry so much about how do we engineer eternal life. Take action. Act as if, act as if you already have eternal life. And by the way, you do. You do already have eternal life because eternal life is a sheer gift from God. It's already the gift that God has given you. And so now you can act as if you have it. And how the greatest treasure in the world is already yours. And you can share it with others. You can be the change you want to see. Because God's gift is granted to you for free. You have grace, and now you are free to live it. I was thinking about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, you know, the old television program. And uh, the guy who founded all of that and was all of that, his name was Fred Rogers. Fred Rogers. And Fred Rogers, uh, he had a Master of Divinity degree from the uh, Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, actually. He was a trained Presbyterian minister. And the only reason I bring that up is because I know my Presbyterian siblings in Christ to be very grace-centered people. Very grace-centered. Well-grounded in the unconditional love of God. And I think, therefore, the point that Mr. Rogers always made in that television program was that neighborhood, real neighborhood, is a gift of God that is poured into the human heart. Real neighborhood, being a neighbor, is something that we are, that we carry within us, and we only need to stir up that gift that's already been given to us. We carry, you and I, neighborhood in our hearts. And therefore, living in God's grace, we can become the neighbor to anyone we meet who has need.
One of the great gifts we have as Christians is the Apostles' Creed, where we are able uh, to express our faith, uh, even in words that we do not readily understand, but still speak powerfully to us. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, we give you thanks for creation itself, for a lovely morning this day. Lord, help us to always appreciate even the smallest gifts of life, so many of those things we take for granted such as the beauty of nature and the air that we breathe and the fact that we are able to be present here in this place. We thank you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Dear God, today we pray for all who suffer, for all who are ill or living in any kind of fear. We ask that your touch would be in their lives in a special way. Some of these, Lord, we name in silence today, and some we name out loud at this time. You may name any person or event you wish in the prayers. lives, O Lord, in various ways. When possible, touch them through our hands. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for other churches this day, for other churches that worship in the name of Christ. We ask that you would bless them in their best efforts. We ask that you would guide them with your wisdom. And help us, Lord, to be drawn closer together with those, even with those with whom we disagree. Help us, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Dear God, we pray for our own discipleship, for the fact that we are your students. Help us to be better students of the Christ. Help us to embody your mercy. Help us to embody your love. Guide us, Lord, in our mission. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, at this time we recognize the offerings that are brought to this house of worship. We ask, Lord, that you would bless the gifts which have been given on this day. Bless the hands which have given, and bless these gifts, Lord, to the furtherance and the strengthening of your purpose and your mission, not only here, but beyond these walls. Lord, in your mercy. We now enter the rite of Holy Communion.
in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven,
we leave this worship space today to give the good news of Christ flesh and bones for those we meet, for our families, for friends and strangers. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.